Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, here we are on Memorial Day. I just want to take a look back at the beginning of this video at what the month of May gave us. And then what we're going to do here in a moment is we're going to compare uh, the precipitation and temperature statistics from May to the model performance. Because as you know, we're going to continue to be looking at those longer range forecast models and combining it with some of the bigger picture things we're seeing in meteorology to make that forecast for summer. So you've been looking here at a map. Uh, that shows from May 1 to May 30th, the total precipitation ranks by climate district. And just a few things to point out here, we have had such a strong and, and zonal jet at times coming into the Northwest that many places in the Northwest are having uh, their wettest May on record, or at least a top 10 wettest. We also take note of this region right in through here, commonly called the Golden Triangle. This is a very productive area in the United States. It actually extends into Southern Canada. Uh, and this has been an area that due to the extended rain shadow off the Rockies has been very dry. They've had a difficult time getting easterly flow back into this area to return moisture. Now, on the southern side of that stronger jet, this is where we've been dry. And we've also seen quite a bit of heat here. But the northern plains and upper Midwest, this section of the Mid-South and, and the plains getting through much of the Corn Belt into the southeast, we have a lot of places that are on the wetter side of average. So we just take this map in and say, this is what May delivered. How well did the models predict it? Well, we tend to rely pretty heavily on the European model. So I'm going to take you back to the beginning of May and show you a forecast run of what was forecast for the month of May, all right? So picked up really well on the heavy rains in the Pacific Northwest, but drier in California, same through the Great Basin. Saw this drier region in through here, the models picked up on that well, plus wetter than average around the uh, upper Midwest and Northern Plains. It also did a good job of picking up on the very heavy rains that we saw at times coming out of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri. Uh, this was an area down here, though, that was likely predicted overly dry. Keep that in mind as we go forward in this forecast. And again, so this is what was predicted, and this is what uh, the verification looks like. All right. So overall, we could make a statement that the model grabbed the pattern. And that's really what we want it to do. We want to see if it can get the pattern, because then we can refine the pattern as we go through each week to see how the forecast plays out. On the temperature side of things, um, this is what the month of May uh, temperature ranks by climate district look like. Uh, very hot to the south of the jet, very cold north of it. Parts of Washington here having their coldest May on record. And many places here in the northwest getting the northern plains much below average. We're going to look at some GDD maps here in a few moments to kind of see the impacts of this. But hot, very hot to the south. So the model gave us this forecast. All right. So if we go back, a couple of things uh, stick out to us. One, we were um, models were overly warm in this area, probably predicted too much downslope flow and therefore a lot of warmer days. Uh, and then you can see here that we did carry a slight warm bias throughout much of the eastern Corn Belt into New England. And that was an area that was forecast to be nearer to normal. Uh, but the temperature pattern throughout the month of May was very much in flux. Would you agree? Like just volatile through this area. So I can't necessarily fault the model for that. But it picked up on this pattern very well where it was quite hot compared to average. Other things that have happened during the month of May are La Nina persists, right? The colder water that's also along the west coast of North America, which we continue to talk about, persisted. And uh, this La Nina, although we've started to see it doing its maybe more normal spring fading, is still uh, packing quite a punch. I mean, take a look at the latest Southern Oscillation Index values. We're up here still around a value of 18 to 19 at this point. Uh, and that, again, we just need to be above a value of seven to really consider the base state of the atmosphere there to be in La Nina. While the trade winds aren't as strong as they once were, we are still seeing the atmospheric response to it. So this continues to be one of the biggest stories we're going to have going into this summer time period. Uh, and we're going to have to keep a very close eye on it. It means a lot for the hurricane season here with respect to wind shear. And this also is going to make a, a very important um, it's going to be a very important piece of where the jet stream will line up as we get into summer. Okay, okay. from here though, we have had one very different thing that's happened throughout the month of May, and that was some major movement of the MJO. After spending so much of spring down here of the Indian Ocean and north of the Maritime Continent, which is north of um, Australia, it made a big jump out in early May and swept through phases five and six very quickly, something that hadn't happened in a while dove back into null space and then emerged today on the 30th back out here in phase seven where it still remains at high amplitude. And what's very important about where it's currently positioned, uh, it has to do with where we're getting the high, 
the strongest uh, velocity potentials or negative velocity potentials, which is here. So if you look where that is on this map, it's, it's sitting somewhere in this vicinity. Maybe an easier way to look at it is just to go down here and, and look at um, the mean position over the next six days of where we have a lot of rising motion versus where we have a lot of sinking motion. So it's in the Indian Ocean over Africa and a whole lot of rising motion, um, the northern parts of South America, Central America, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico. And it appears, if you just kind of take a look here at the longer range forecast, that that pattern might stick around for a while. And every anytime we see this this time of year, it gets our attention turned to the tropics. And if you've been uh, watching along uh, this weekend with what's going on in the tropics, you know that we do have a hurricane down here. This is, so let me get you oriented, this is Mexico coming into Central America here. So we're here in the East Pacific. You can almost see the clearing of the eye. Now why you can't see it is because we're using GOES-16. So we're getting a little bit of a shadowing effect here. But this is a pretty powerful hurricane that's falling apart now that it's made landfall in Mexico. But um, it was up to 105 mile an hour today. And it's expected to go right here across Mexico, weakening substantially, but delivering a lot of rainfall. It's very mountainous in through here, and that, that will certainly disrupt the, the hurricane. But the support for rising motion in this area remains. So when we look out there over the next five days, the National Hurricane Center has given us a 40% chance of seeing some development here. And I wouldn't be surprised to see this increase with time. And here's a couple of reasons why. Some of the models are suggesting that whatever was left of Agatha is going to start to move toward you know, the, the strait here or toward Florida. Uh, in fact, we're seeing some of the models really go after aggressively developing this. So if we just look at the chance or the probability of getting a tropical depression, you know, as we play forward through this week into this upcoming weekend, you see that the models through early next week are giving this area in here. Let's just take it back here. Uh, June 3rd through June 7th, you know, this is a 60 to 70% chance, maybe even higher than that, of having tropical depression development. I think the main concern out of this is going to be the rainfall. And this is what we've got right now. You can see that that part of Florida uh, could possibly pick up compared to normal now, uh, two to four inches in excess of normal. Now we're going to come back to in a few moments the pattern that's leading to this and what all this very wet weather is going to be coming out of Kansas and Missouri uh, in just a few moments. But if you don't mind, I'm going to take a step back and come back to what we started with, the long range forecasts. Because this afternoon we had released the new European weeklies. Now this is what the month of June is shaping up to look like. In fact, let's just go from uh, you know June 1 to June 30th here. And when I look at this, seeing how much rain we are expecting now here, and rain we're going to be getting in through this area, it makes me question if we're pushing the risk of drought farther and farther down the road. Because you know that throughout winter and summer, if you've been keeping up with my videos, I've been more concerned than normal about the risk of drought in a large area in the middle part of the country, largely using the La Nina plus uh, the model guidance uh, to, to tell you why I'm concerned about that. But if we just play this out once again, we'll just take it out to the same time period we took Thursday's run out to, right? July out uh, to July 10. So this is June 10 to July 10. We see the models opening up a region in through here where to the west and south of that line things are looking drier. There's another important part of this and that is the models are attempting to really jumpstart the southwestern monsoon. And to jumpstart the southwestern monsoon it's got to be able to pull into this region and to do that we need to have some heat building into this region as well. So that's another indicator that we could start to see some sense of ridging that's going to probably anchor here but it's not happening now. It's, it's not setting up now. This is all pretty far into the future that the models are doing this. And then the net effect of that, let's draw that last line back on there, is that it would open up this whole region to a lot of thunderstorm activity, something we've seen a lot of, and we're even watching it today in the upper Midwest. So the storms run over that ridge and comes racing through the Great Lakes and Eastern Corn Belt. Now along the east coast, much of this heavier precipitation is due to the development of a big subtropical ridge sitting somewhere over here, helping to feed into this. But that's, that's the interpretation we have right now of what's going on with the longer range precipitation forecast. And again, what you're looking at here is June 10 to July 10. I'll show you the temperatures at the end of this forecast video for that same time period. Now, by the way, um, on the 5th, we get new long-range data from the European. That's the first of all the models to give us that, so I'll be sure to provide that update for you. But that'll give us a seven-month outlook. Now, over the weekend, let's get an update here. There we are. Over the weekend, 
uh, up until 4 o'clock this afternoon on Memorial Day, you're looking at total accumulated precipitation. So a lot of this was early in the weekend pulling out. Much of the, a big section of the country was dry until we've lately seen this big system come through the northwest and has really ejected here, delivering some very heavy rainfall. I talked to some growers in South Dakota. They sacrificed the weekend for the rain. Uh, that was what they said to me, and I understand that. But there are certainly some places in here that are going to be getting, or are right now getting some nasty storms. Let me show you what's going on there. Here's the surface wind field right now. Okay, so you can see the elongated front coming all the way down into Texas, but the tight circulation in this area. Let's step this up just uh, about a mile above our heads, and we see that right here on this side, there is a very strong, what we call low level jet, right next to the low. And on top of that, up at the 500 millibar level, we have even stronger winds. So there's an abundant amount of shear, both with respect to the speed and the direction in this area, which is kind of giving way to the risk of, of very strong storms. And we've already watched them going in this area. In fact, let's get an update on this map. There we go. We have a tornado a watch out for this large area. There's severe thunderstorm warnings in through here, flood to the north of it, and strong winds all around it. That's what you're seeing in this particular area. And I was watching it today on satellite. And outside of the convection down here in the southeast, most of it's happening right up here right now, going through parts of uh, South Dakota out of Nebraska, clipping western Iowa, and then racing right here through parts of Minnesota. And just remember, this was an area that multiple times this year has been hit with some really nasty storms. So uh, the rest of today, uh, this is what our outlook is for severe storms. So they've actually increased this area to a moderate risk. And you've already seen some of the storms going through there. And then tomorrow, this would be uh, on the 31st, a large area from, from parts of uh, Michigan all the way down to the Panhandle of Texas here, uh, where we're going to be watching out for strong to severe storms, likely the worst of which could be right around the tail of this. And then day three, so this will be June 1st, that just continues to move east. Very slow moving fronts, it's that time of year, the fronts really slow down, so it takes a while for them to cross the country. All right, let's go look at the high res NAM to get some idea on the timing of this. So I'm gonna start this off just a couple hours from when I'm recording. That's where those storms are expected to be in Minnesota, and this is a pretty potent system here. So as we play through the overnight hours, so this is 10 p.m. on Monday, getting into the early morning hours on Tuesday, you can see the the boundary still sitting here from parts of western Illinois all the way down to parts like Kansas City, while the rain shield still on the backside of this going near and to the west of the Red River Valley of the North. As we then play through early morning on Tuesday and get this out into Tuesday afternoon and evening, right in through here along that frontal boundary is where we're going to be watching for the strong to severe storms. It's going to be quite cold on the backside of this. I'll show you that in a few moments. And if you watch my videos and you're down along the Gulf Coast, we're on one of those weeks where it is just daily chances of storms. That's, that's where we are right now in this pattern. So that's Tuesday night. Let's play out here in the overnight hours getting into Wednesday morning. And as we play through Wednesday midday, now you start to see where the risk of storms is along the lingering boundary and the wetter weather that's on the back side of this. And we're going to talk about how much we're expecting here in just a few moments. From here though, I would like to show you this pattern. Now, I left it all the way out here at the very end because I'm very interested in what's going on here, but let me take it back and show you this. Okay, so this is the trough that sweeps through. There's the second trough on the tail end that helps elongate that front, that's by Wednesday. But I want your attention right here and right here, okay? There is no sense of blocking in this pattern. I know you're going, wait a minute, I see some big ridges here just east of, or excuse me, the west of Greenland. I know you see that, but the flow is complete underneath it. So this isn't a full block just yet. And as I get out there to this weekend, remember how we've been talking for a while about the extended Pacific jet? Going from this weekend into early next week, the troughs that are lining up here just continue to send very high momentum air into the Pacific Northwest. And checking in again on that website I showed you lately, this would be the one that tells us if the Pacific jet stream is extended or if it's retracted back toward Japan or if it's shifted south toward the equator or north toward the poles, you can or toward the North Pole, excuse me, you can clearly see that it's still got a jet extension here. And this is extremely valuable information in terms of what to expect in the forecast. It tells me where that you know momentum is coming from that's going to be translated across the country. I just want to show you something. Uh, you know, this work right now is supported by a NOAA grant, which means my ability to help increase forecast accuracy is is being sponsored by your tax dollars as well, going into the work that gives us this kind of information. So it's just a great thing about uh, what we do here in this country. 
From there though, I would like to give you your multi-model analysis to show you the effect of this. So we've already seen through, remember you got the GFS on the left, the European model on the right. We've already seen through where that front stagnates here by Wednesday evening. So see it right there, okay? Now as we go past Wednesday evening into Thursday, we're gonna continue to see the front slowly move here bringing up the risk of strong to severe storms from Pennsylvania all the way back down to Texas. It is in both models. But you just notice there's already another system lined up coming toward the Northwest. It's in both models by Thursday. As we play out through Friday, getting into Saturday morning, Saturday midday, and Saturday evening, the models really have this down. See it? And this is that tropical system. GFS is a little bit farther south and east. But that is the potential tropical system that you know was once Agatha that then organized here in the Bay of Campeche and is moving toward Florida, delivering quite a lot of very heavy rainfall. So that would be uh, this upcoming Saturday night. As we play through Sunday and then into Monday, one of the things we notice is higher pressure here to the south of it could have a front sitting in this area, increasing the chances of rain. It is in both models. The GFS has got even more precip in the Eastern Corn Belt for early next week as well. But just playing this on out, it is important to note that the European, the operational European, takes this thing, keeps it pretty strong, and moves it just offshore. Now, of course, this is an operational run I'm watching again right here. So we don't really know how well this will, how valid this will be. But certainly going on all the way out there to the 6th, excuse me, the 7th of June, we do see a corridor opening up a wetter weather with a low here. It's in both models. So this is what happens when you have an extended jet. Things stay quite active. I'll just show you total precip from the European model. Both models performing quite well right now. So here's all the rain and storms tonight, getting into uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Frontal boundary stalls out here, wetter weather. Keep an eye down here on the Yucatan. Watch the system come out and press across Florida. And then the next system entering this weekend here in the Northwest. And you just put all this together, and over the next 10 days, there's some places that are looking to see some very wet weather. And this is what's interesting to me. Through the beginning of June, this is an area that we are very concerned about drought developing. And yet right now, we've got some wet weather coming in, which means we're pushing the risk down the road in terms of being concerned about the drought. It'll have to be when that Pacific jet breaks away from its high momentum state that we start to see the risk of ridging and more semi-permanent highs and lows. But out here through June 6th, there it is. And if I just keep playing this forward, you see June 9th, June 10th, 11th, more troughs coming through. But as we get out here toward June 12th and 13th, I'm starting just to notice something at the end of the runs. While we still see an extended Pacific jet, does it start to split in the west? I want to know that. I am expecting to see some heat build in here while we have some lingering cooler weather moving through the Great Lakes. But this is what this will do. This will increase the rainfall through this area. So the week two precipitation pattern has one system that comes through this area. And that's why you see above average precipitation from Montana, parts of Montana, eastern Montana through New England. This is primarily from one trough that's going to be sweeping through. So this doesn't mean the entire week is wet. It just tells us that there's a system coming through here the models are picking up on. All right. On the temperature side of this, oh, I just want to show you, I'm sorry, this is uh, the GFS, very similar forecast. Just wanted to show you some model consistency. Let's wrap this up with a discussion on temperature. So I made some new maps for you today. I know, I hope you're watching this in full screen so you can kind of zoom in here. But since April 1, this is total accumulated GDDs. Now this is a base of 50 and a max of 86. So we're just looking at um, basically a corn calculation, but it's, it's useful uh, to, to have a look at here. But it's a number that's a bit deceiving because, of course, we weren't having a lot of people planting on April 1st, especially in the midsection of the country. So what I want to do is I want to flip this over to a GDD anomaly map. All right. So the reds are where we're above the 20-year average. The blues are where we're below the 20-year average. And you can see from the Pacific Northwest where we're in some places at almost a 200 GDD deficit versus Texas, which is at a 200 GDD surplus. Uh, the difference is all based upon where the jet comes in. And that's what we're seeing here. Now from here, let's take a look at where these temperatures are going. We've already experienced these today on Monday, very cold throughout the West right now compared to average. As we get into Tuesday, that translates there into the Northern Plains. And then the cold dives down on Wednesday. So we saw this right uh, with that precipitation coming through there. Toward the mid, uh, end of the week, Thursday's temperatures compared to normal and Friday, then getting out there to Saturday 
and Sunday. Now, after we see this pattern evolve with the cooler weather here, that's going to continue to push east with time because it's open and moving. What I'm going to be watching is the heat coming into the west because day 10 through 15 has given us some strong signals of temperatures being 10 to 15 degrees above normal in California. And of course, we know the, the risk right now of drought developing in California, or I shouldn't say developing, but continuing in California as we press through uh, the, the summer here with the reservoir levels as low as they are in places. This high temperature uh, forecast here increases the risk of high evaporation rates, but we're gonna move this cooler air out as well once we get past, uh, I'd say, the first 10 days of the month of, um, of June. So to show you that, take a look. This is day 14 through 21. So it's the week of June 13th through the 20th. And as we play it forward, just sliding forward one day at a time here, we see that by the end of June and the beginning of July, the European model is still quite aggressive on the placement of that ridge. And so it's there. And we started the video verifying the model's performance and we see reason for this with the La Nina and other factors like the MJO, but we need to see it verified. So I'm going to be watching carefully. I'll report back to you again on Thursday. Have a good week. Thanks.